I realize that, apart from my Vault series supercut, I have never created a longer video discussing Vault Tech's sinister social experiments. It's time to change that. In response to the population unrest caused by the global conflict known as the Resource Wars, the pre-war American government hired Vault Tech, a relatively new defense contractor, to construct a series of fallout shelters. These shelters were intended to safeguard the general population in the event of a nuclear disaster. At some point while Vault Tech was in the process of constructing shelters across the country, the project was commandeered by a fraction of the government a secret, shadowy group that we know as the Enclave. Instead of providing safety and protection to a portion of the American population, those fortunate enough to secure residency in a vault became the unwitting subjects of sick and twisted experiments. This is three of the worst vault experiments in the Fallout franchise. Vault 112 First up is the home of the infamous Dr. Stanislaus Braun, Vault 112. Located beneath Smith Casey's garage in the Capital Wasteland, Vault 112 was a gift from Vault Tech to Braun. As the director of Vault Tech's societal preservation program, Braun was responsible for devising and implementing the various vault experiments seen throughout the Fallout franchise. As a sign of gratitude for the scientists' many achievements, Braun would be named the overseer of Vault 112. There, he would have the power to enact one of the most sinister experiments the Fallout franchise has ever seen. Vault 112 was designed to accommodate 85 dwellers, each connected to virtual reality loungers linked to a Think Machine 3600R mainframe. The promise was that these fortunate few would live out perfect lives in a simulated VR world indefinitely. To ensure their longevity, a dozen Robobrain caretakers were assigned to monitor the residents' vital signs and provide them with the necessary nutrients to sustain their lives. A perfect world forever. Sounds like heaven, right? However, unbeknownst to the dwellers, the simulation was completely controlled by the deranged overseer. For two centuries, Braun would create new worlds, such as Toucan Lagoon or Slalom Chalet, for himself and the dwellers to inhabit. But often, Braun grew tired and bored of his creations, instead finding joy in inflicting harm upon the dwellers. After his heinous acts, he would have the mainframe wipe the dwellers' memories clean, resurrect them, and start anew in a different world. Sometime before the events of Fallout 3, Braun activated his latest creation, a suburban cul-de-sac known as Tranquility Lane. Despite its name, the world was anything but tranquil. It was here that Braun assumed the form of a young girl named Betty. As Betty, Braun took pleasure in being mean to others, particularly a boy named Timmy Newsbomb. The virtual reality world was Braun's playground, and the people trapped in Vault 112 were at his mercy. Only a miracle could free the dwellers from their torment. In 2277, a scientist arrived at Vault 112 in search of Braun's pre-war notes, holotapes, and computer records anything that could help him bring a massive water purifier online. To his surprise, he discovered Braun himself, over 200 years old and kept alive by a VR lounger. James, the scientist, entered an empty lounger to communicate with him, but unexpectedly found himself transformed into a dog. Woof woof. Fortunately, James had a 19-year-old child following in his footsteps, the Lone Wanderer. The Lone Wanderer made their way to Vault 112, entered a lounger, and met with Betty. Betty agreed to release the Lone Wanderer's father on the condition that they completed a series of tasks. These tasks became increasingly violent, starting with making Timmy cry and escalating to murdering all the dwellers while dressed as the pint-sized slasher. Upon completion, Betty freed the Lone Wanderer and James, allowing the father and child to reunite. Unfortunately, the Lone Wanderer's actions would initiate another cycle of torment for the remaining dwellers. However, there is an alternative. It turned out that one of the residents, Old Lady Dithers, still retained fragments of her memory. She knew that she was trapped in a simulation and recognized the innocent child, Betty, as the deranged Brawn. She advises the Lone Wanderer to investigate an abandoned house, mentioning the presence of a failsafe terminal. Upon entering the house, certain objects emit distinct musical notes when interacted with. 
by playing a portion of the Tranquility Lane theme melody or interacting with Radio Pitcher Gnome Pitcher Cinder Block Gnome and Bottle in a specific order, the failsafe terminal will be revealed. Within the terminal, correspondence between Braun and General Constantine Chase can be found. Dr. Braun, here's the revised code for the military training program you've expressed an interest in. If you can run this program with the failsafes off, as requested, your real-world test subjects will die if killed in the simulation. It goes without saying that, officially, I denied your request. General Constantine Chase Braun, for reasons outlined in another terminal entry, had a failsafe installed within Vol-112's mainframe. If initiated, the Virtual Reality Lounger life support systems would be disabled, meaning that dying in the sim would result in real-life death as well. Braun elaborates in an entry titled Failsafe. There are days I consider finally pulling the plug, as it were, and putting a permanent end to both this simulation and my life. That is the reason I requested installation of General Chase's Chinese Invasion program after all. By disabling the safety protocols, I have ensured that each subject in Vault 112 will physically die if their in-simulation avatars are killed. Real world death. End of simulation. The perfect failsafe. At least it would have been if not for my own misjudgment. I knew, when the simulation first went online, that the secondary safeties those established for all vault tech and military personnel would prevent my own real-world demise in the event of a failsafe execution. In the end, I would kill the subjects and save myself. I wouldn't want it any other way. Or so I thought. It's true that the failsafe would scare the living hell out of every resident in Tranquility Lane and lead to their brutal deaths. But then, what about me? I have no ability to disable my own safety from within the simulation, and any other avatars I could create would be driven by the simulation's AI routines, not actual living thinking human subjects. Where's the fun in tormenting a machine? And so the release of the real world subjects is more than they deserve, more than I could bear. They'd be dead, and I'd be left here in Tranquility Lane, alone and tragically bored for all eternity. I can think of nothing more unacceptable. By initiating the failsafe, Braun would remain alive, but cease to have control over the people in the simulation, an outcome that Braun would certainly not want. And so, what do we do? Well, we find ChineseInvasion.exe and boot it up. Upon exiting the house, a group of simulated Chinese commandos will attack the Tranquility Lane residents, killing all but Betty, James, and the Lone Wanderer. Finally, after 200 years of torturous hell, the Vault 112 dwellers could finally rest in peace. Honestly, the whole story of Vault 112 reminds me of Harlan Ellison's short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Though instead of an allied master computer keeping humans captive and torturing them for eternity, it's the immortal vault -Tec experiment Puppet Master. Give it a read. Fun fact, the story is actually fewer pages than this script. Vault 11 Located in New Vegas' Mojave Wasteland, Vault 11 housed an experiment straight out of a dystopian short story. In fact, Joshua Sawyer mentioned in a livestream that the heart of Vault 11 is inspired by Shirley Jackson's short story, The Lottery. Like many other vaults, the inhabitants of Vault 11 had no idea what they were getting into until the vault door sealed behind them. Once settled, the original overseer revealed a chilling requirement. A death sacrifice would be demanded every year, or else everyone in the vault would perish. To determine the sacrificial offering, the vault's residents decided to hold an election. Much to the overseer's surprise, his own name emerged as the winner. However, unlike typical elections involving handshakes and baby kissing, this one would be more morose. And so at the end of the year when the sacrifice would be required, the dwellers forced their original overseer to walk the steps to the sacrificial chamber. And thus, a dark tradition was born. From that point on, a new overseer would be elected annually. This overseer would hold the same power and privileges that come with the position, but a new responsibility would be added. Come term's end, the elected overseer would be forced to walk the sacrificial path. As the years passed and overseer after overseer met their demise, strategies to avoid becoming the next sacrificial leader emerged. A meta, if you will, would be formed. 
To increase their chances of survival, the residents formed six distinct voting blocks, governed by the impartial coalition of Vault 11 voting blocks. These blocks were as follows. The Allied Service Workers Block, Divine Will Block, Human Dignity Block, Justice Block, United Vault Technicians Block, and the Utilitarian Block. Each block would select one unfortunate candidate to endorse and campaign for. The coalitions of Vault 11 voting blocks provided annual election guides summarizing the candidates for that year. Dear fellow Vault Dweller, congratulations, your dedication to the democratic process is the bedrock upon which the continued stability of Vault 11 is based. Now to help you make your decision for this year's election, the coalition of Vault 11 voting blocks has put together this handy Dweller's Official Guide to Obtaining Overseers Democratically or Do Good that contains a summary of leading candidates for overseer as well as their statements, key positions, and most importantly, endorsements. Sincerely, Roy Gottlieb, Chairman, Coalition of Vault 11 Voting Blocks, President, Justice Block. Candidate, Henry Glover. Endorsements, Utilitarian Block, Divine Will Block, Allied Service Workers Block. I'm a devoted husband and father of six beautiful children. My oldest, Sam, was on the honor roll this quarter, and I couldn't be prouder of him. My youngest, Henry Jr., just said his first word, and it was Dada. We've got this bond already, and he's still just a baby. Friends, when you go to the polls this election, I want you to think of your own children. Then I want you to think of Sam and Henry Jr. Picture their faces. Nate Stone should be the overseer, not me. Candidate, Donna Haley. Endorsements, Human Dignity Block, United Vault Technicians Block. I'm aware of the rumors circulating about me. I want everyone to know that they are vicious lies being spread by other candidates in a desperate smear campaign. I have never in my life done anything so depraved, let alone for such things. But even if I had, that still wouldn't mean you should vote for me. Consider the fact that I am grossly underqualified for the position, and that both my opponents are far more deserving. I know nothing about governance. You would be hard pressed to find a worse candidate than me. I can promise you my administration would be a disaster. Candidate Nathan Stone. Endorsements Justice Block. This is ridiculous. I shouldn't even be a candidate, and I wouldn't be if it weren't for all the dirty backroom politics going on around here. It's sickening. You should all be ashamed. What remained unknown to everyone at the time was that the nomination of the final candidate listed, Nathan Stone, would set in motion a series of events that ultimately led to the extermination of the entire vault. A notice of postponement can be found in the vault. Fellow citizens, due to the tragic events of the past few days, the coalition of Vault 11 voting blocks has unanimously decided to postpone the election for Overseer pending further investigation into the murders. Your security team wishes you to know that they are working tirelessly day and night to find the perpetrator, and are already following up on a number of promising leads. God willing, if the killer is apprehended swiftly, we may have found a promising new candidate for Overseer. Sincerely, Terry Hart, President, Human Dignity Block. A series of murders unfolded within the confines of the vault causing the election to be postponed until the identity of the serial killer could be uncovered. The security team was confident in their ability to apprehend the culprit, and it was revealed that Nathan Stone's own wife, Catherine Stone, was the perpetrator behind the gruesome acts. It was revealed that members of the Justice Block grew frustrated with Nathan's consistent poker victories, leading them to nominate him for the election. The Block's leader, Roy Gottlieb, and others, resorted to blackmailing Nathan's wife Catherine, coercing her into engaging in sexual acts with the group in exchange for her husband's safety in that election. However, when the Justice Bloc betrayed their agreement and still nominated Nathan, Catherine took matters into her own hands. She orchestrated a series of murders in an attempt to diminish the voting power of the Justice Bloc. Her plan was simple. Fewer members meant fewer votes against her husband. Catherine's plan would lead to herself being elected and eventually winning the overseer position. After all, it's easier on the conscious to sentence a serial killer to death than any other alternative, right? 
But for Catherine, this was actually all according to plan. Her first act as Overseer was to issue Overseer Order 745. Effective immediately, the traditional selection process for Overseer is hereby ended. In lieu of a yearly election, a citizen will be chosen one month prior to the start of his or her term with our mainframe's random number generator, ensuring complete impartiality and fairness. With Order 745, the concept of the annual election and the influence of the voting blocs were abolished. Power was now shifted entirely to an RNG roulette. In response to Order 745, Roy Gottlieb devised a countermeasure. He and the remaining members of the Justice Bloc armed themselves, seized control of the vault's vital resources such as power, food, and water supplies, and planned a coup in an attempt to claim direct power for themselves. A holotape recording captures a conversation between Roy and another member of the Justice Bloc discussing their plans and strategies. She can't do this. It's done. We're done. Nothing's done. She's got the authority. The only thing she can't do is change her own fate. Nothing says she can't change the selection process for future overseers. I say she can't. You shouldn't have toyed with her like that, Roy. We still have the majority. We don't vote for anything anymore. I'm not talking about voting. What then? You wanna have a sit-in? A hunger strike? Not exactly. Maybe march into her office with torches and pitchforks? Yes. Come on. I mean it. What? Start a revolution. Laws don't outlast their governments. Roy, all we have to do is wait until someone from Justice Block gets picked for Overseer. Then we have them change the law back. There won't be any blocks after the new Overseer is picked tomorrow. Everyone's going to move on. By the time we've reformed, who knows if we'll still be in the majority? We can hold the block together. You don't know that. Besides, what if the computer picks you? What if it picks me? And your solution is to start shooting? Not if we don't have to. Look, we arm up. We go to the lower floors, take some strategic targets. Power, food, water, just until she turns authority over to us. The other blocks won't support it. They're tired of us having the power. We have the majority. We don't need them. This isn't a vote, Roy. They'll fight back. They've never had the nerve. Hell of a way to test it. The events during the coup are not documented, but the aftermath of Catherine's order would result in a measly five remaining vault dwellers. The fighting, the choosing who gets to live and who dies, had finally taken its hefty toll on the survivors so much so that the group decided to go against the vault's orders and send no one to the death chamber. All right, I know you can hear me, so listen up. There's five of us left. Five out of I don't know how many. So, it's over. We've talked and it's over. We're not gonna send anybody to die anymore. So shut off our water, our gases, or do whatever it is you're programmed to do. But we're done listening to you. Instead of being met with their own anticipated deaths, the Vault supercomputer issued a congratulatory message. Congratulations, citizens of Vault 11. You have made the decision not to sacrifice one of your own. You can walk with your head held high knowing that your commitment to human life is a shining example to us all. And to make that feeling of pride even sweeter, I have some exciting news. Despite what you were led to believe, the population of Vault 11 is not going to be exterminated for its disobedience. Instead, the mechanism to open the main vault door has now been enabled, and you can come and go at your leisure, but not so fast. Be sure to check with your overseer to find out if it's safe to leave. Here at Vault Tech, your safety is our number one priority. The vault door would open. Having overcome the vault's twisted test, the remaining Vault 11 dwellers were now permitted to leave. They would instead choose not to. A final holotape records the last moments of all but one of the final Vault 11 dwellers. Are we really gonna do this? It's open, we could just leave. I couldn't, not after that. We don't deserve to leave. A shining example. That's what it called us. But we were. We did what we were supposed to. Not by a long shot. Anybody would have done what we did. You ask me? That's exactly the problem. Now let's get on with this. 
I'll go first. Wait, wait. People should know what happened. They could learn from it. If there's anyone out there at all, I hope they never have to find out. Ready, Harry? Yeah. No, 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 wait! <sighs> Four gunshots and a heavy sigh. Vault 75. The last vault we'll be discussing today is one from Fallout 4. Found underneath Malden Middle School in the Commonwealth, Vault 75 was meant to house the school's students, their parents, and staff. Where many believe that Vault 75 would provide extra peace of mind in the event of a nuclear attack, the vault turned out to be anything but safe. A basic summary of Vault 75 can be found on the Overseer's Terminal. Overseer Directives Residents aged 18 and older must be removed from the general population annually. Residents who have exhibited genetic promise are to be preserved for genome harvesting and reintegration. Residents of average genetic promise but high intelligence and docility may be recruited to the research staff at overseer discretion. All other residents to be removed must be culled. Research staff is responsible for cultivating embryo replacements to maintain consistent resident population numbers. Vault 75 is to remain sealed until an all-clear order is issued by Vault Tech. These directives paint a rather ominous picture. It turns out that Vault 75 was part of a classified military program aimed at enhancing and perfecting human genetics across multiple generations. The research staff's objective was to create the ultimate super soldier through continuous improvements and experimentation. Upon entering the vault, everything appeared normal for the first week. However, all children under 17 were separated from their parents and gathered in the atrium while the parents awaited a briefing from the head of security in the holding area. In reality, this briefing was a cover for a massacre. Now orphaned and alone, the children received guidance and support from personnel officers and caretaker robots who helped them adjust to their new environment. It's unclear what explanation was given to the children regarding the absence of their parents, but the details are ultimately inconsequential. Isolated from the rest of the vault, researchers and scientists could carry out their experiments and closely monitor the children's progress. To determine which children exhibited the best genetic potential, strength, and intellect, the researchers conducted a series of tests. These tests included an aerobic aptitude assessment, traditional classroom studies, and notably, practice at an in-house firing range. To illustrate the brutal nature of life within Vault 75, let's examine the test protocol for the aerobics station. This station exists to measure and increase aerobic ability and cardiovascular health of test subjects. As the treadmill operator, adjust incline and speed to reach and sustain target rate in the subject. Once target rate has been sustained for more than 60 seconds, gradually increase duress until peak heart rate has been reached or exceeded. The accompanying entry titled Side Effect Guidelines provides a list of acceptable and unacceptable events that would halt the test. Strikingly, the only events deemed sufficient for stopping the test are cardiac arrest and death. In other words, this sprint endurance test would continue until the participant reaches their peak heart rate as intended, suffers a heart attack, or dies. The extreme nature of this test is quite evident. In order to motivate the children to willingly participate in these grueling challenges, they were fed stories about the horrors of a place called Up Top Land, which is our equivalent of the Wasteland. The Overseer would inform the kids that they needed to excel in their classes and training to make Up Top Land a safe and happy place for everyone. However, the reality was far different. Upon completing their training and classes at the age of 18, they would not be released to the Wasteland to bring goodness to it. Annual Turnover Protocol Beginning one year after initial containment, children over the age of 18 must be removed from the general population. This will be done annually, on a date specified by the Overseer and Chief Scientist. It is recommended that this graduation be treated as an important tradition inside Vault 75. 
appropriate ceremonies should be conceived of and performed by overseer staff, with outgoing subjects being removed one by one from the main living area. Once separated from the general population, subjects with aggregate ratings of excellent and superior are to be escorted to the genomics laboratory for processing. Subjects with excellent and superior intellect ratings, but not aggregate, will be offered positions as overseer of research staff per discretion of the overseer and chief scientist. All other subjects should be disposed of as outlined in the confidential operations packet. It's kind of fricked, isn't it? Although the specific details of the genetic harvesting and child creation procedures are not explicitly mentioned in Vault Terminals, the overall process can be summarized as follows. Individuals with desirable traits were harvested for their genetic material, which was then utilized to grow new children. Intelligent and agreeable individuals were recruited for the scientific team, and anyone not meeting these criterion were disposed of in some manner. This disturbing cycle would repeat whenever someone reached the age of 18, essentially turning the vault into a factory aimed at creating the perfect specimen. However, at some point during the vault's lifespan, a secret plot would emerge to overthrow the twisted work that vault Tech had orchestrated thus far. Hi James, I was able to mess up the scheduling program. The system won't expect us to test anyone after lunch for a few days. If you're right about the overseer having helpers, I don't think anyone's noticed. Anyway, this will give us some time to get things ready without prying eyes. We can start smuggling ammo in here. Nobody should find out if we're pinching a bullet or two at a time from the range. Still need to figure out a good fuse, but it'll take us a while to get enough gunpowder smuggled in from the range before that matters. In a top secret operation against the oppressive regime within Vault 75, two lab assistants, James and Rohit, start to gather ammunition and gunpowder. Their plan was to overthrow those in power and bring an end to the atrocities being committed in the vault. With the support of the children, they initiated a revolt that quickly spiraled into chaos. By the year 2287, the Gunners, a ruthless mercenary group, had taken control of Vault 75. The remnants of the vault's previous occupants are now evident only through the scattered children's toys left behind, serving as haunting reminders of the innocent lives lost. And that is three of the worst vault experiments found in the Fallout franchise a mad scientist playground, a democratic death sentence, and a child churning factory. If you can think of any other vault experiments that are just as bad, let me know. Perhaps I'll be making a part two in the future. As always, thanks for listening. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. You've led a great life. Living it has been its own reward. But it is only the beginning. Close your eyes now, and imagine what joys await you in the next life, the afterlife. Can you see them? Good.